Welcome back to Redeemed by Grace Fellowship. I am so glad to see you. We're having a little bit of bad weather outside today, so I hope we don't have any problems with this video recording today. Yeah, that's right. Let's pray about that, right? So we can get through this without any severe weather knocking this out. So here we go. Uh, First thing we need you to do is to go right down below, hit that subscribe button to this YouTube channel. That, that we make sure that you get our content, that it, you will always receive it. Hit that little notification bell as well, so that you get notified as soon as a new video has dropped. Uh, this is Passion Week, and at the end of Passion Week, you're going to find an extra video. Then we're not going to promote it too much. But you that have subscribed to the channel, you are going to know about it. If you've hit that subscribe button, if you've re hit that notification bell, and most importantly, friends, make sure you hit that share button. Yes, you've heard the YouTube saying sharing is caring. But when we're talking about the gospel, that's the truth. Because we get an opportunity when we hit that share button to share the gospel across the world. Uh, so please subscribe. Hit the notification bell and definitely share and share this out to as many people as you can. We are continuing our study on the Gospel of John. Let me bring that to on my screen here. Uh, and as we do that, we're going to be closing out chapter six. Uh, we have got into a uh, prolonged, if you will, Discussion on the first of the I am statements in the book of John. And uh, we'll kind of cut, uh, review that here in a second. But uh, uh, we've come to the end of the very first one about uh, I am the bread of life. And so we're going to take a look at that today we're, uh, and see how that all fits in, not only with the proclamation that we saw in the first four chapters about who Jesus Christ is, and but also the opposition to Christ that we've been looking at since chapter 5 and we'll continue to look at over the next uh, few chapters. So uh, again, it's a great lesson. I hope you've had an opportunity to take a look at it uh, and uh, we should have a good time together. But before we do that, let's go ahead and pray together. Almighty God, we're just so thankful that, again, we could come together uh, to, to study your word together. We ask your blessings on this time together with each other and with you in particular. And, Lord, we pray that you would uh, clear our minds of the clutter of life, that we might hear you speak through your very word. And, Lord, just to, uh, anoint us with your presence. Anoint us with the Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that we gain understanding of what it is you would have us to do with this scripture and how it affects our lives and the same questions that the, these people dealt with back in the day, uh, including uh, the apostles, that we too have to deal with and every single one of us have to deal with. And so, Lord, help us there. Help us with our belief and help us with our unbelief as well. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we love you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Well, as we take a look at where we were uh, last week, uh, again, we moved to this opposition to the Son of God, and we've looked at it from a couple of different standpoints now. And uh, as we uh, got into the last... Uh, three-fourths, if you will, or two-thirds, one or the other, <laughs> uh, of chapter 6. Uh, we, in particular, saw this opposition uh, during and after the Passover. In this particular occasion, we're back in Galilee following the Passover, uh, uh, where this discourse has taken place. He's already fed the 5,000, he's walked on the water, and he was over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee after all those events, and uh, all of a sudden the crowd shows up, and again, they they remember being fed back there and how that was great, and, and they're really interested in his miracles and what he's doing, but they're really not interested in knowing God. They're, they're more, it's more like a heart that says, 
give me a handout, if you will. Uh, and so that is kind of, and he knows it, and he's going to call him out on it. And that's where we began to uh, uh, to see these statements come into play that he has been talking to. And the first one, of course, is the bread of life discourse. But uh, I am the bread of life. That is the first one that he uh, uh, starts with on this list right here, uh, that wow. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. And I am the vine. And the unique part about this whole, all these statements is the beginning of that phrase, the word I, or the phrase I am. And uh, why is that important? Well, if we go back to the story of Moses and the burning bush, uh, we find out that the incarnate Christ is the light that was seen in the bush. And that uh, at one point in the discussion, uh, Moses asked, well, who should I say sent me? Because uh, God is sending him now to back to Egypt to deliver the slaves, basically. And um, and he's like, well, why are you picking me? I, I can barely talk. I'm, I, 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 I don't talk very well. And because uh, he did have a stumbling issue, kind of like me, right? But anyway, <laughs> he uh, 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 he basically, well, who should have told him sent me? And, and, you, and he's told, you tell him that I am, that I am, I am has sent you. And so that word I am to the Israelites became a very sacred word. It was so sacred and reverent that you didn't even say it. You didn't even write it. And so when they wrote the word out, they left the vowels out of it. And it actually is the word that becomes Yahweh uh, uh, that we know uh, today. And so that uh, is the significance with these statements. For as he begins uh, uh, each one of them, he is claiming deity. And that is what really begins to set off this opposition uh, with the, not only the religious leaders, but we see this opposition that uh, occurs among the crowds. And we see this opposition even today amongst the disciples that are following him. And I'm not talking about the 12, the 12 uh, uh, are, are a little bit different. He's going to address those 12, um, even though one of them we know is the devil uh, and Judas, but uh, and the other 11, uh, uh, they remain with him, but we do see the other, other disciples that do departing. And so uh, that, and we're going to learn some theological things wrapped around that as well. So that's kind of a cool thing as we see, but this is where we started, and we're actually continuing on this, so we'll see this uh, slide here in just a few moments as well, and as we've been going through the uh, scripture, uh, the last three weeks since we've been on this bread of life, it's it, we had to break it apart a little bit, because it is quite lengthy in the number of verses that we had to deal with, and so Another, uh, in order to make a video that would actually download time-wise, we needed to uh, shorten it up a bit. So we broke it apart. And so we're going to go back as we play the video or, or the audio reading of this account. We're going to start at the beginning from three weeks ago, hear that and last week's reading, and then add on to it this week's reading. Again, I'm going to be using Bible Gateway app. Uh, where I can have Max McLean do the reading. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is I'm promoting that for you. Uh, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, uh, I, I'm recommending highly that you do download, even if you do have a copy of God's Word, you ought to do this. But go and download uh, a Bible app on your favorite device. It, it helps you uh, be able to study the Word of God. Uh, not only with commentaries and things like that at a click of a mouse or at the touch of a finger, depending on what device you're using, but uh, you have the opportunity to listen to it read to you. So in addition to your reading and study, you can reinforce it in the ear by having it read 
to you. And that's great when you're doing things that you can't sit and hold a book or do with highlighter and all that kind of things like I like to do. But uh, uh, like driving a car or, or uh, out mowing the lawn or washing dishes, whatever you might be doing, man, you can put on a headset, earbuds, whatever you like, and play it read to you and just soak it in, listening to it read to you. Just really helps our maturity uh, in our faith as we just uh, saturate our entire life with the Word of God. So I will slide off the side here, and we'll go full screen with this to make the text a little bit bigger. We're going to be starting in verse 22. If I queued it up right, remember I didn't do it, cue it right last week, but well, that's all right. We heard a couple extra verses. <laughs> that's all. But here we go. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they... That we may see and believe you. What work do you do? It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. But my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God. World. They said to him, Sir, do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whatever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God, Everyone who's heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and i will raise him up on the last day for my, my flesh is true food my little drink whoever feeds on my flesh 
and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. can listen to it. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed, and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. All right. Well, that's the entire text, the discourse in its entirety that we just heard played out. And that's kind of a neat way to hear it in its entirety. And again, the fact that we had to break it apart, it's some, sometimes disappointing. But yet it allowed us to concentrate a little more heavily on a couple of key issues. And, and so that's a pretty good thing as well. So, But today's verses, they, they constitute the... Uh, reaction obviously of Jesus's disciples to his sermon on the bread of life uh, response in Jerusalem back in chapter 5 that we saw and of course just like we saw in Galilee in chapter the first part of chapter 6 the response of many of his disciples was unbelief and a rejection outright rejection of him. In fact, when we take a, uh, 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 John, it really lists basically two groups, two groups that we see uh, with this opposition. We see, uh, uh, let me get it to the right page. chapter. After the, ser the sermon, only a small nucleus of disciples remained, and we see that in Those who reject the word will reject the Savior. And those who receive the word will receive the Savior. As we know from the beginning of this uh, Gospel of John, the word became flesh. The word is Jesus Christ fulfilled. And so uh, that's important for us to remember when we're trying to understand what John is saying here as he's connecting that those who receive the word will receive the savior and experience the new birth uh eternal life and we remember him talking about new birth with nicodemus 
And, and yet we all have to answer to this question. Every one of us. Who is Christ? And what am I going to do with him? We all, every person has to answer that question. And that's an important question that we all have to deal with. Well, let's begin to break this down. We're going to start with verses 60 and 61. And it says again, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Uh, who can listen to it? And if you remember what he was talking about just previously, he was talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, right? And we kind of talked about that last lesson. I'm not going to go into too much detail on it. And if you're not sure, if you're just catching this for the first time, go back and watch the previous lesson. You'll see a lot of detail discussion about that statement he made and what that means. But uh, uh, that is kind of, they didn't get it, did they? And so that is what they're kind of uh, looking at here. But Jesus, knowing in himself that, uh, his disciples were grumbling about this. He said to them, do you take offense at this? And so uh, many of uh, Jesus' disciples, uh, they had that same reaction as the Jews had in verse, back in verse 41, uh, and, and the, uh, 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 the first generation of mumbling just like their fathers, the, the Israelites in the desert with the manna that we I took a look at back in verse 40, uh, 41. And the perplexing words of Jesus, I mean, it's more than just puzzled some of the uh, disciples. But it, it just outright floored them a little bit. Uh, but it, yeah, it, uh, it, 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 and it, it puzzled them just as much as it, as it did the mixed crowd that they had before. I mean, Disciples, by the way, uh, if you do not know, this word here refers to the total group of followers who had attached themselves to Jesus. Uh, however, loosely, obviously, but not solely to the 12. Because a lot of times people, when you hear the word disciple, you think about the 12 guys that followed Jesus. Well, yeah, the 11 of those will become apostles. Uh, but a disciple is simply, the word means student. So we are disciples of Christ as students of the gospel. And so uh, that's important. So there were many, many people following around. Even after the crucifixion, which we'll see at the end of the uh, Gospel of John, uh, the, the group is gathered together. In fact, we did a study on the book of Acts, and you saw that very scene uh, right off the bat in chapter 2 of the book of Acts. If you haven't done that study, please uh, go check that out on YouTube as well. Uh, but uh, so there's a, and there's about 120 people in that room. Uh, we know, uh, uh, so they were all disciples uh, in that particular time. So that that's what that word actually is referring to. So any who couldn't understand him uh, or were willing to trust him uh, completely withdrew. They took off, and they they lacked the spiritual perception to grasp his meaning and what he was talking about, about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And again, we talked about that last week. So again, if you are confused on that, go back and take a look at that uh, lesson, the previous one on YouTube or Rumble, wherever you're watching this. And Jesus, Jesus's inward knowledge of the disciples enabled him to detect their attitude. He knew what they were thinking, as he does for each one of us as well. And that's a scary thought sometimes. Because, you know, we might be able to hide stuff from our even our spouse and family. Not all things. They know the, uh, us a little, a little bit better than some others do. But, uh, uh, but uh, God, there's nothing we can hide because he knows what's going on in the heart, the questions in the head that aren't spoken out loud or a reaction that's not seen. And, and so he knows that genuineness to falseness. 
uh, his questions uh, revealed their true status, the genuineness of their faith here. If they uh, couldn't understand the meaning of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, how in the world would they be able to understand his resurrection or his ascension, which he refers to here? Uh, if they were be uh, bewildered by his language, how much more difficult would it be for them to find uh, find the final event that would uh, lead to his return to God? They're not going to get that. And so that becomes an issue here uh, right off the bat. And he knows what they are. And so uh, he, he asks some pretty tough questions. And again, these questions he's asking... He asked each one of us. We all have to re uh, wrestle with them. And either we turn to faith upon his drawing us, or we reject the message and we turn and bail, just like the others. There's many, many a people that have gone to a church and made a proclamation for Christ, participated for years and church stuff, and then all of a sudden abandon it all. Well, they were never genuine to begin with. So let's take a look at these next verses, uh, 62 through 63. Then what if you were uh, to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? In other words, going back to heaven. He, you don't believe eating the flesh and drinking the blood, but hey, what if I just uh, fly up in the air and go right before your eyes back to heaven? We know he's going to do that with his true disciples, but that's with these guys, they wouldn't have known what was going on. Uh, and they still wouldn't have believed. They didn't believe any of the miracles they were watching. They didn't, he just fed them. He fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. It had a bunch of leftovers. <laughs> you know, uh, he's healed people. He's risen some uh, someone from the dead. And they've witnessed all this stuff, and they're looking at him going, how in the world? They don't believe this stuff? And you scratch your head and wonder why. Well, we're going to answer the question of why today. You're going to see exactly why they don't believe and why you have friends and family that also won't believe because God has spoken to it. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. I mean, this reference to the ascension, first of all, is one of the uh, one of several in the gospel. The disciples had complained that the concept of Jesus being the true bread that comes down from heaven was an incomprehensible uh, statement, and he indicated that if they were to witness him uh, uh, his coming ascension back into heaven, they would be even more astonished, and it proves his pre-existence, of course, as he returns to where he was before, right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, friends, takes a person's belief in Jesus' words and activates Jesus' life in that person to give him or her spiritual life. Salvation cannot be attained through human effort. Jesus insists that the Holy Spirit is the one who imparts life to a believer. It's not transmitted by a process of, of uh, physical eating or, or anything like that. Jesus was, and he was just saddened here by the dullness of some of his disciples that prevented them from genuinely believing in him. Let's take a that, uh, look at uh, verse 64 here. But there were some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew 
from the beginning, those were who who it was who would betray him. He's all knowing. Uh, we know that he knows everything. He knows the intent of the heart. He knows our deepest thoughts. He knows what we need before we pray, even. We said that last week, so I thought I'd bring that back. But Jesus' reference uh, to those who didn't believe this explained his later allusion to Judas that we'll see in verse 70 at the end of the lesson. Uh, Jesus had, had, had given ample opportunity for faith uh, to all those who followed him, yet from the beginning, his spiritual discernment made him aware of those whose faith was genuine and those whose attachment was only superficial. I mean, that's reminiscent of John's words that we saw back in chapter 2. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Jesus knew the hearts of men, including those disciples who followed him. And he supernaturally knew that many didn't believe in him as Messiah and Son of God, who, so he didn't entrust himself to them. These false disciples were simply attracted to the physical phenomena of miracles, food, and they failed to understand the true significance of Jesus' teaching. I mean, the one who would betray him, of course, we know is Judas. And again, at the end of this chapter, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so let's look at uh, the next couple of verses. And he said, this is why I told you that no one could come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Well, we talked about this in detail last week, too. Um, so if you, again, uh, missed our lesson, you need to go back. Just go back and watch the previous lesson again after you finish this one. This is important because it'll fill in those uh, questions that are now going ding, ding, ding in your head <laughs> a little bit there. So, but last week I, I asked you guys this question. Uh, why would the Father give some, but not all? To Jesus. And we're looking at verse 37 to be specific. And I'm not going to reread that verse, but you could take a look at that if you need to see what it says. But, well, here it is again in verse 65, basically. Uh, and again, God is the initiator and the sovereign author of our salvation. However, human beings are still responsible for accepting or rejecting God's gift of grace. And Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient and effective for all who do indeed come to him. Now, how does the Father enable us to come to him? Well, since the human heart is wicked and all humans are sinners, we're unable to submit to God on our own. God must draw us to himself and open our hearts before we can accept the gospel. And although men and women are commanded to believe and will be held accountable for unbelief, genuine faith, friends, is never exclusively a matter of a human decision. And once again, in the face of unbelief, Jesus has reiterated God's sovereignty involved in the selection for salvation. And God Grant, only grants to Jesus those who are willing to respond to him. The Father cooperates with a person's decision to believe in his Son. Think about this, friends. We talked about this in detail. Because of the depravity of man, we would never seek God. We would never choose God. We don't want anything to do with him because we are happy in our sin. We are all about self. We don't want to do anything that somebody else does to us. Friends, if you are an unbeliever, you do not have free will. You're in bondage 
you were a slave to sin and to the prince of the air, who is the devil. That is the truth of the scripture. Once a believer, once God's got a hold of you and pulled you out of that and given you salvation, it gives you a new heart. You become a new creature. You become reborn in Christ. And as a result of that, you now are able to see the difference between sin and not sin. And you now have the ability to understand and desire not to want to sin again. And your desire is to seek God passionately. Does it come right away? Absolutely not. It takes growth and maturity. But as you continue to put your trust in the Lord and for what he wants, he brings you out of that and delivers you fully for the, through the course of your life from sin. My friend, he begins to make you holy. You're, when you become a Christian, you're not instantly holy. You are saved, and that can never be taken away from you. But now he's transforming you to become more and more like Christ. Christ's blood imputed on you, paid the penalty that you are due. That's what we celebrate this week in Easter. And that and he is. He was put to death for it. He took the death penalty that you deserve, that I deserve, and he rose again that we might have life through faith in him. And those that do not aren't going to perish. They're already dead. They're already condemned because death means eternal separation from God. Eternal separation from God is hell. So this, some people want to say, well, that's a hell on earth. Well, no, there's not. But <laughs> if you're separated from God on earth as, and you're, during your life, you're warring against him. And so, yeah, that can be. But you want to see hell in this week of uh, Passion Week before Easter. Look at Christ on the cross. And you will see it. You will. It will it, oh man, it's horrifying to look at this. Because you see God Himself dealing with hell. And it is remarkable of what He has done. All right. So, why did. Why did so many of his disciples abandon him? Why did, why did so many disciples abandon Jesus? Why did that happen? And because of this utterance that he gave, the, the attitude of some of the disciples had changed. Either it was too difficult for them to understand or comprehend, or it offered, uh, uh, or it offended their sense of self-sufficiency. And some may have been disappointed that Jesus refused to become that conquering king that they had t anticipated. What do we mean by that? You remember the uh, Jews had grown up expecting the Messiah. And it became that they didn't really pay attention to what the prophets had said was going to be uh, true about the Messiah. And they were expecting this royal king to come in on the great white horse and, and overthrow the Roman government and put everything back in order and that the, the Israel, the lowly Israelites, would be lifted to prominence here on earth and they would rule with the iron fist and so on and so forth. And they heard all this murmuring about this Jesus he is the new Messiah. He is the Messiah. And, and so they're expecting that. They see these great signs that he was doing, these miracles, his feeding, and all this. And they know something special about him. But, hey, let's go through. It's time to go. Come on. Remember, that's why he left. 
after the feeding and went off by himself because he sensed that they were about to come grab him and take him to be king. Uh, and he and that is not why he's here at this time. He will be coming back in that type of glory and power and authority at a second coming. But his purpose right here is to redeem man so that there is a remnant of those that are called believers that will indeed be with him for eternity and will rule with him. And I hope, my friend, that you're going to join me and others uh, that uh, he has indeed uh, brought about a new life. Uh, some uh, uh, others, people there uh, may have found Jesus' teachings baffling and his, his instructions may be threatening. I mean, Jesus, he offers eternal life, but he requires his followers to accept him as their Savior and Lord. And most are unwilling to do that. They want to be Lord of their life. They think they could save themselves. That's why religion was born. Friends, that word religion is so misused. You see, the word religion has to do with the study of man. Go to any university and you walk into the department where they do religious studies. And you look at the big corporate department that they're located in. You'll find it in the Department of Humanities or even under Anthropology. What do all those mean? The study of man, not the study of God. Theology is the study of God. And, and so there's a difference. Uh, religion is what man wants. And when man doesn't like a specific way, he creates a new one. Uh, that is more to his liking. In other, way, other words, he creates his own God for his own uh, image, uh, in his own image, as opposed to God creating us in our, his image. And, and they flip that upside down so that that God can be whatever they want it to be. People have even taken Jesus and done that. They've even done that. And they, they uh, skew away from the truth that is his word and doing so. Uh, and so uh, you have to really, really pay close attention because uh, Jesus, he does offer eternal life, but he requires his followers to accept him as their Savior and Lord. And this means his agenda must become his followers' agenda. And that's unacceptable to many would-be disciples or false disciples. And that is a harsh reality. In fact, uh, when we look at uh, uh, let me scoot ahead. I think I got these misnumbered. I do. Uh, there is a point that we see here. Immediately the father of the, the child cried out uh, with fears, uh, with tears, and uh, bolded this a little bit. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And friends, that is so true uh, in our lives as well. In fact, we prayed that today at the beginning. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because uh, think about that. Every one of us that are genuine believers still have doubts that come about. The apostles did. We're going to see that uh, all the way through the book of John. Uh, and so uh, that is because of this flesh nature, this human nature that we have that still wants to do its own thing, which is sin against God. To do its own way. It's like the kid. I don't care what mom and dad says. I'm going to do what I want to do. There's even a song that's even in a commercial where kids are dancing in school singing, I'm going to do whatever I want, and you can just leave me alone, teacher, and, and authority. And I'm like, uh, 
well, okay, uh, that's satanic. But anyway, uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, verses 67 and 69. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Now, pay attention to what Peter's going to say here. Uh, Peter is a bumbling fool, if you will, type character. Uh, he might, we might call him a country bumpkin in, in our culture. I don't know what you what I'll call him, but uh, he's, a, he's a fisherman who hung around Galilee. He was uneducated. Uh, he was kind of a mess a little bit, a little hot-headed. Uh, easy to draw the sword. In fact, he will uh, later, and uh, 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 it, and can be led astray very easily as well. Right now, until uh, uh, we'll see that change later as God deals with him and changes him, we will actually see uh, his progression uh, as he grows uh, in the faith, uh, especially after the resurrection and even after the ascension and uh, at the time of Pentecost as well. So um, let's take a look at this, uh, finish reading it where I leave off at. And P Simon Peter uh, answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life and we have believed and have come to know you that you are the Holy One of God. That you, boy, what a bold statement. But again, know that Jesus knows their heart and Jesus knows that this is a genuine statement. You're not just words coming out of his mouth. It's not lip service. This is heart service. This is truth coming from his heart. And how did that come about? Only God could put it there. Only God could put it there because human heart would never choose that. Human heart would reject that. Uh, only those who, who continue with Christ in the school of discipleship, if you will, will receive more understanding from him. You hang in, you'll get it. And that doesn't mean everything we're talking about in these lessons. You're, if you're a new believer, you're not going to really get that a good write these questions down that you have because my friend yeah, the, as you grow and grow one day I, I like to keep a journal so i go back and i look at some of stuff i wrote back early on and i, I go wow has god really grown me and it gives me something to really praise him for and looking at how he has changed me and really molded me for his purpose and i and i think that's important for each one of us as we do that, um, but that uh, if you remain with him, you're going to get uh, receive more understanding, and you become you will learn to know Jesus and knowing intimately, even knowing the sufferings of his crucifixion, and that is important. And those who drop out won't know that; they won't know anything. They think they might, but they don't know. Our Lord ever wishes to encourage faith that is weak. And he has a great deal of concern and love for his disciples. And that's why he asked a question that expects a negative answer. You do not want to leave too, do you? Boy, can you imagine being one of the 12 and that's, I mean, first of all, you you are startled that, hey, these guys are deserting and leaving. Um, should I be leaving or should I be staying? What? I don't get it. You might be angry that they're leaving. You might be like real puzzled about it. Um, but here Peter says, look, you're the one that has the words of life. And we've believed it. We've come to know that you are indeed the Messiah. You are the chosen one. You are the Son of God. And that is an important thing. Where else are we going to go? 
where else are we going to go outside of God? I mean, there, even if there was another place, it's beneath God, so why would I want to go there? Right? Jesus didn't try to talk unwillingly to his disciples into, to, into staying with him. He didn't try to talk them in. Hey, just hang around. Nor did he make it e things easier for them so that they would reconsider. Absolutely not. And friends, sometimes in the falseness of religious practice in Christianity, we see people that want to talk all about the love of God. Boy, he does love us. He showed us that on the cross. But it, it comes across as, you know, my life is just all messed up. And if I put my faith in Jesus, my life is going to be hunky-dory. It's going to be a bed of roses. We're going to be skipping the streets of gold. And, uh, and then you get in and life kicks you in the teeth. Because the scripture also says we're going to suffer for his namesake. The world's going to hate us as believers because it hates Jesus Christ. You want evidence of that? Turn on your TV tonight and watch the news. There has never, especially in America, been such an attack on Christianity as there is right now. So that's important that we need to to do. So he didn't try to talk them into staying. He wants eager, eager followers who understand the cost of following him, that understand it's not going to be a bed of roses, but where else am I going to go? you the one that has the eternal life. It doesn't matter if somebody kills me right now. I would rather be with you than to be anywhere here. What an important privilege we have, believers. What an important, important thing. As we see the these pictures of this is kind of scene that some artists have come up with. I mean, these words of Peter declared that nobody else had the life-giving message of Jesus and that there was no other source that uh, that would satisfy them. I already said, whoever drinks of this water will never thirst again, right? We talked about that at the woman of the well. And here with the bread as well. Only this, the, the one eats my flesh, that this bread of life will indeed be satisfied. And in spite of all his unusual awkwardness, Simon's faith in Jesus was genuine, and he evidenced true spiritual sensitivity here. I mean, his statement represents the spiritual discernment that the disciples had ne never had, had to, or that the, 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 excuse me, that the, the disciples had developed during their association with Jesus. They've been walking with him now for a good long time. And times, the time comes for all of us uh, when a, a life of faith in Christ seems more difficult than we expected. They're suffering them all. And here's the question that each one of us must answer. Where else can we go? And Jesus alone promises eternal life. And although we face troubles for a little while here on earth, because of him, as Roman 8, 18 declares, the sufferings of this present time aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us with Christ. Man, believers, keep your eyes on Jesus through everything. You've ever seen the description of uh, uh, Stephen 
as he's stoned to death. And we might see that here in a few weeks. But uh, he is, that is exactly right. He is being stoned to death for preaching the gospel. And yet he sees the glories of Christ and is willing to, to uh, not fight back, but allow it to happen because he is about to be rewarded. I mean, the, the, uh, the emphasized use here it, grammatically of this verse uh, as we look at it, and you can see it there, uh, the one I'm referring to, kind of small, but it's right there on that slide. But if we look at the uh, uh, look at the grammar of it, the, the use of the first person plural pronoun implies a contrast between the twelve and those who deserted Jesus. We have believed. We and the Greek tense that's used here indicates that Peter is affirming that they had reached a final and firm conviction that Jesus was indeed the Holy One of God. I mean, the Greek, uh, Peter's words were somewhat pretentious and that he implied that the true disciples somehow had superior insight and as a result came to believe through that insight. Well, where did the insight come from? It came from God himself. It came again. He says, "You would not know that if the Father hadn't told you that." And how does the Father do it? Through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit, that is revealed to us by God and God only. Last two verses. J Jesus answered them, "Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet." One of you is a devil. And he spoke of he, he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Look, nothing that happened throughout the course of his ministry, that being Jesus' ministry, including Judas's betrayal, took Jesus by surprise. Hey, God's plan would be fulfilled even though it involved using Satan and his followers to accomplish it. In response to Peter's words that the disciples had come to believe in Jesus, he reminds them that he sovereignly chose them. I chose you. And he did. And if you go back to the book of Acts, and look at the beginning of it, you'll see every one of them and how that happened uh, as he chose them all. And uh, so Jesus wouldn't allow any human uh, pretension in God's sovereign selection. And Jesus indicated that his choice of the 12 was conscious and deliberate, yet indicated that his choice of the 12 uh, was uh, his and that he included one of them who knew he knew to be a traitor, to be a Satan. And Judas had no less opportunity than the others to know and serve Jesus. He didn't treat him any differently, nor uh, was he a, a victim of discrimination, if you will, uh, for he was given a prominent place among them as treasurer of the group. That's right. Judas carried and took care of all the money uh, that the disciples had as they traveled about. And yet he chose to be dishonest in his financial administration and selfish in his attitude. And he also chose to betray Christ. I mean, the word devil, the word devil here, and that's catching some of you, uh, I'm sure, when you look at this. It means, uh, in the original language, slanderer, liar, or false accuser. I mean, the idea, perhaps, is better rendered as 
uh, one of you is the devil. It, it, it's kind of what it, it, it's saying there. And the supreme adversary of God uh, so operates behind fallen human beings that his malice becomes theirs. It's true. He is, again, the prince of the air. He is the ruler of the world in all the world system. Jesus supernaturally knew the, uh, the source and identified it precisely. This uh, clearly fixes the character of Judas, not as a well-intended but misguided man trying to force Jesus to exert his power to set up his kingdom, as some will argue, but as a tool of Satan doing absolute wickedness. I mean, verse 71, the last half of what you see on the screen, it reads up kind of like a footnote, doesn't it? Although the Gospels uh, never uh, indulge in any length in uh, denunciation of Judas, most invariably his name is followed by the phrase, who betrayed him him being Jesus, of course, uh, on the word Iscariot, his last name, the word uh, most likely is from Hebrew, and a Hebrew word being a man of uh, Keroth, and that, then, and that is the name of a village in Judea uh, as well that uh, is known, uh, and as the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, as soon as uh, he was named, he became identified as the betrayer. The name Judas is a popular name. Uh, uh, and so when we look at that, anytime you saw Iscariot, you knew exactly this is uh, Judas the betrayer. That's just the way that was. It, 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 any other time you see the word Judas, you don't know if it's him. Any time in the Gospels that you see the word Judas and it's the betrayer, you see Iscariot to identify him most importantly. Well, friends, I, I, we've gone through quite a lot of stuff here in this as well. And it, my prayer is that you do become a believer in Jesus Christ. And if you have not, and you have questions, if you have things you're struggling with right now, that's a good thing. That's not you fighting. That's God fighting for you. He's trying to tell you the truth. He's trying to get you the attention. And he will not give up if he's working on you. He might work on you for another 20 years before you believe. But he's going to be there. He's going to be tugging on your heart. He's going to be revealing himself. So, my friend, I pray that you would turn to him, that you would be freed from this bondage of sin, that you would come to know him for eternity, that you put all your faith and trust in him, not only for salvation, but for transformation, that he may change you, that salvation become a brand new creature, reborn into the likeness of God. Put away the death of the sinful nature, the corrupt nature that came about through the fall of man and sin. And you become new in Christ. Friends, if, uh, we've kind of alluded tonight uh, through a couple of different other studies that you could go through uh, here on YouTube. We do have uh, one, a walk through the book of Acts. While we were doing the walk through the book, book of Acts, someone contacted us over email which you can too. There it goes on the screen right now at the little scroll bar. It is rbgf22 at yahoo.com. Anytime you have a question or 
or suggestion or something you would want, you could fire that over. And we got one that said, hey, do you have anything for the basics of the faith? Well, you see it right there, the fundamentals of faith. Uh, so go right ahead to that. Obviously, we're going through the Gospel of John right now. Uh, and uh, some people really wanted to look at when we uh, Christmas time to look at the Christmas story, but not uh, necessarily from the Christmas story how the New Testament. But uh, hey, all these uh, it, everybody always says that uh, there's all these prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, who he is, and what he was about. Uh, what are some of those? And so we actually went through the uh, uh, Christmas of old, as it was called, and we looked at Jesus through the eyes of the Old Testament, uh, the coming of the Messiah. And so uh, that's an interesting study, if you like that, uh, to kind of look at a prophecy and thing. So uh, take a look at that if you like. Uh, but make sure that you not only subscribe to this YouTube channel, uh, make sure that you also uh, uh, go hit us up on uh our other platforms, you'll find us not only on YouTube and Rumble with their videos, but you would also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, True Social, and LinkedIn. Uh, we are experimenting with a couple others, uh, such as Pinterest and some others. Pinterest, I don't know how that's going to work other than just reposting what we're already putting out there, but looking at other formats, including some blog, uh, blog uh, uh, podcasts that we can maybe be able to do as well so uh but if you're if if you feel that god might be asking you to help us with some of that i don't know whether you uh, do it from a technology standpoint for us uh whether you uh, actually uh, want to teach uh whether you're teaching uh, kids whether you want to teach uh, uh if a lady want to teach ladies hey hey uh, we'd love to do stuff like that Send us an email at rbgf22 at yahoo.com. Let's talk about it as well. We do have a new study that's, uh, well, I think we're on about a fifth week coming out, but it's a, we call it uh, 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 Sermons for Kids. And it's a little short video. Uh, it's going to have little lessons for the kids. And of course, this week uh, we'll be talking about the resurrection. So uh, that'll be coming out later this week. So if you would like uh, your kids to maybe see that, uh, to make sure you hit that YouTube channel and, sh and uh, subscribe to it so you'll get notified on that as well. Uh, as well. And uh, well, quite frankly, at the rbgf22 at yahoo.com, we got an email saying, hey, can you mention my kid's first name? And so if you would like us to do that, uh, and uh, mention your a kid by name. They'd, when they hear their name uh, mentioned, uh, somehow written into the uh, the program, uh, they really, really perk up a little bit. Wow, he said my name. <laughs> Can he see me? <laughs> That's funny. But uh, 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 that is a new one that we do, and uh, we might you might be one that would like to be more involved with kids ministry. I don't know. RBGF22 at yahoo.com. Give us a shout out if you would on that as well. But uh, um, it also uh, is important that uh, you do share these messages out so that we can reach more and more for the gospel. I will say this again, friends, uh, Redeemed by Grace Fellowship is not meant uh, to be a replacement or a substitute for the local church. God created the local church for a specific reason. We go into detail in the study of the book of Acts about that. Uh, you'll hit it pretty hard in the final minutes of the faith, too, of why that needs to be true, but or that is true. Uh, and, and so um, it's important that you are part of a local church. If you're not sure what to even look for in a local church, uh, shoot me an email. Again, rbgf22 at yahoo.com. I'll give you some biblical criteria that you can pray over and to uh, uh, use as a guide as you visit some churches. If you need help knowing about some churches, uh, again, on that email, let me know that where you live, and I will give you a couple of possibilities that you might go and prayerfully consider 
to see if that is where God wants you to serve. And that, that's a hint at one of the criteria. A criteria for the church is not, what can I get out of the church? But what does the Lord want me to do at that church? Tough question. If you need ex explanation on that, rbgf22 at yahoo.com. We'll talk privately about it. Again, we don't open up a, a, a chat line. We don't open up a comment section on our videos because when we do have a conversation, we want to do it over email so that it's confidential and then it's private uh, with just you. Uh, because some of you uh, are having needs such as substance abuse or, or uh, some other hardships in life and uh, you're making contact with us and uh, we'll be glad to have those conversations try to get you help if need be whatever it might be uh, that we could try and help to do so uh, that's important but uh, next week again we will uh, be going into the ver verses uh, let me bring that back up because uh, yeah verses 1 through 31 of chapter 7 uh, we'll take a look at those so if you get a chance to read those in advance or listen to it read to you uh, that's always a good thing, and uh, we'll do that. So let's pray, and then we will get out of here. I think we made it through without any tornado sirens going off or lightning striking and, and taking the power out. So thank you, Jesus, for that. So let's pray, and then we will get out of here, and we'll see you next week. Almighty God, we're just so thankful again that we can get together to open up your word to, to examine the, the tough things that are in there, the joyous things that are in there, that everything it is that you would have us to do. You created us. You know exactly the way it should be. And uh, we, because of sin, know that we choose to do the other. But, but God, thank be to God that you called us back to a life in Christ that you have redeemed us from death to life in him and may we have a passion to learn and to have an intimate relationship with him we love you we praise you and we lift this prayer in the only name that we can and that is the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ and amen. Well, friends, I love you. You have a good week, and we will see you next week. Don't forget to go to church Sunday for Easter.